Hello, welcome to Rogue Rocket. My name is Maria Sosian, and today we're going to be talking about movie critics, how they help people decide what films to watch, and how one website has become the most feared among movie studios. Let's start with the basics. Critics have played a vital role in the movie industry for decades. Studios vie for critics' approval well before a film is released because they know that these reviews could make it or break it for them. For the last few decades, researchers have studied the influence of critics' reviews on box office outcomes. Many of these researchers have argued back and forth that reviews have no tangible impact on how much money a movie generates. And I say argued because it's been a hot button topic for years. But before we get into that, let's take it back to the beginning. In the mid-1900s, film critics shared their opinions in local newspapers and advertisements. But since there would usually be only one reviewer per local paper, that person's opinion held great sway over moviegoers in the area. Once film criticism made its way to television, the landscape changed. Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert's show at the movies brought criticism into living rooms all across America and made film reviews mainstream. Bathroom humor, Gene. And it's, it's very funny. Humor. It's very funny it's bathroom not humor. That. If you think it's funny, yes, then I maybe do. you need to grow up along with Eddie Murphy. Oh, Roger, that's right. You can both right. go to Richard that's Fire right. and learn how to be a little more mature. Yeah, let me tell you, it is very, very funny. Many would say that Roger Ebert remained the biggest name in movie criticism of the modern age. His and Siskel's two thumbs up still echoes through the web today. Film studios today invest much of their time and money in ensuring that their film opens with a bang. A huge emphasis is placed on hosting screenings for critics and securing as many positive reviews as they can get. And that need to have your movie come out with a bang has led to some crazy stories. In the early 2000s, two marketing executives at Sony's Columbia Pictures figured they'd help themselves by cutting out the middleman and paying a critic for good reviews. Enter David Manning. Manning worked for the Ridgefield Press, and beginning in July 2000, he was quoted in advertisements for six Sony films. The Patriot, Vertical Limit, Hollow Man, A Knight's Tale, The Forsaken, and The Animal. Here's where it gets good. Manning did not exist. He was completely made up. Sometimes his quotes were the only ones that appeared in advertisements, and for a little while, Sony got away with it. That is, until a reporter caught on. John Horn, who worked for Newsweek at the time, happened to be working on a story about controversial junket critics who would give bad films positive reviews in exchange for VIP treatment. While looking through some quotes used in advertising for the animal, Horn came across Manning's review and reached out to the Ridgefield Press, which happened to be in Connecticut. And after being told that they had never heard of a David Manning, Horn decided to contact Sony, who eventually admitted to making him up. A Sony spokesperson told Newsweek it was an incredibly foolish decision and were horrified. And in June 2001, the two advertising executives involved were suspended without pay for 30 days. And Sony agreed in an out-of-court settlement to pay each customer who saw those movies because of Manning's reviews $5 if they were dissatisfied. Fast forward almost two decades, and nowadays it seems like positive reviews alone are not enough. Movie studios are also vying for the approval of media giants like Rotten Tomatoes. Studies commissioned by Hollywood Studios have found that if films Rotten Rotten Tomato score may have some influence over whether or not people actually go out to see a movie in theaters. And this may be one of the reasons why Rotten Tomatoes has become the most influential critic website. So today, we're going to look at how the so-called tomato meter has reached new heights, and if it exerts any influence on what we decide to watch. For those who might not be familiar with the website, it aggregates a score depending on the reviews and ratings of hundreds of film and TV critics. The measurement they use is called the tomato meter score. And here's how it works. The more positive reviews a film receives, the more fresh the score. If the reviews are at least 60% positive, then the film gets the red tomato, meaning anything below 60% will warrant a rotten score or the famous green splat. And at the top of the Rotten Tomatoes food chain, we have the coveted Certified Fresh rating. Movies that hit 75% are given the seal of approval. And there are other requirements too. You also need at least five reviews from top critics. Films in wide release must have a minimum of 80 reviews. Films in limited release must have a minimum of 40 reviews. And Rotten Tomatoes actually sends you a physical trophy if your movie is certified fresh. There's also an audience score from one to five stars to accompany the tomato meter. The total score is the percentage of users who have rated the movie or TV show show positively. When at least 60% of users give a rating of three and a half stars or more, it gets a full red popcorn bucket. Anything less than 60% calls for a green tipped over bucket. It's important to note that the audience score is made up of verified ratings, meaning Rotten Tomatoes has confirmed that the user submitting the review actually bought a ticket to the movie. This is a relatively new feature, but we'll get into that later. Over the years, Rotten Tomatoes has become a valuable tool for both audiences and movie studios. Decades ago, the only way to evaluate a film before it was released to the public was to read reviews and publications like the LA Times, the New York Times, or the New Yorker. Today, moviegoers increasingly turn to the tomato meter as more and more movies and shows get released. While this may seem like a conspiracy 
movie theory? According to the National Research Group, 36% of moviegoers visit the site before seeing a movie, compared with 28% in 2014. And that tendency to check Rotten Tomatoes makes some film critics uncomfortable. Pete Hammond is an awards columnist and a film critic for the online magazine Deadline. Rotten Tomatoes is a black and white approach to everything. This is just one-stop shopping for people so they can look and see like, oh, critics like that, critics don't like that. It's as simple as that. These people spend two years making a movie and it comes down to Rotten Tomatoes, just deciding just like that. You know, you go on, just click it on, don't spend five seconds looking at it, but you know, oh, that's, that's not fresh, I'm not going. I hate that, you know, it's, that's what it's come down to though. Every day, staff members at Rotten Tomatoes search the web to find every review of every movie, collecting from major news outlets like Deadline and well-known critics. In most cases, they'll contact these critics and ask them to submit their review on Rotten Tomatoes. While many critics do, some don't either because they're too busy, they don't want to, or maybe they just forgot. Now this is where it gets interesting. Based on my conversation with Pete, if a critic doesn't log in and submit a review, Rotten Tomatoes staff might do it for them. And here's how that's done. Each review is read and a determination is made about whether it's mostly fresh or rotten. But sometimes, as you can imagine, it's hard to tell how a critic actually feels about a movie from the review. When this happens, the Rotten Tomatoes curation team reads the review and makes a decision about how they thought the critic felt about the piece. And if they still can't come to a decision they'll try reaching out to the critic. This process was also cited in a recent article by the LA Times. Critics like Pete have their own accounts and can submit their reviews and ratings to the site themselves. But the way Rotten Tomatoes is set up on the back end doesn't allow much room for flexibility. Critics are simply asked to choose whether the film is fresh or rotten. Then, according to their selection, give the film a 3 out of 5 or 4 out of 5 rating if it's fresh or a lower rating if it's rotten. As reviews get submitted, Rotten Tomatoes calculates an aggregate score. The system is obviously not perfect, and many think that's a problem considering how much weight it carries, especially when you consider that a critic can take the time to thoroughly review a film, commenting on the plot, character development, cinematography, the emotions the film evoked, and so on. But Rotten Tomatoes is geared towards people just looking at the aggregate scores rather than individual reviews. And those aggregate scores arguably matter. According to The Hollywood Reporter, a study conducted by the National Research Group states 7 out of 10 moviegoers are less likely to see a movie if the Rotten Tomato score is between 0 and 25% on the tomato meter. In September, 2017, after what was dubbed the worst summer in 20 years, the New York Times reported that studio executives were blaming Rotten Tomatoes for poor movie performances and a loss of billions of dollars at the box office. However, around the same time, Eves Bergquist, the director of the Data and Analytics Project at USC's Entertainment Technology Center, published a study which found that there was no correlation between Rotten Tomatoes scores and the box office returns of the 150 films in 2017 that earned more than $1 million. Various studies have been conducted over the years to determine the extent to which film critics influence movie outcomes. A recent study conducted by Owen Egan at Emerson College found that based on reviews from Rotten Tomatoes, film critics have a moderate influence on wide releases and a weak influence on limited releases. And this moderate influence could have a significant impact on box office revenue. One of the goals of this study was to determine whether film critics serve as influencers or predictors. Previous research has found a variety of seemingly conflicting results. This is not only about the overall influence of film critics, but whether they serve as influencers, that is the degree to which they influence box office performance in the short term, and whether they serve as predictors, that is the degree to which they serve or influence uh, box office performance in the long term. Uh, for instance, previous studies have found that film critics are both influencers and predictors, that they are influencers but not predictors, and that they are predictors but not influencers. And there has even been seemingly conflicting research based on Rotten Tomato scores. Some research has found that Rotten Tomato scores have an impact and some has found that they don't. However, Despite these differences, all of these studies are valid. In this particular study, Egan found that film critics moderately serve as both influencers and predictors. But over the years, the effects of being an influencer have been highly debated, notably during opening week. According to a 2010 study, early ratings may be an important quality signal and could contribute significantly to opening week box office numbers. Egan's study toned down how much reviewers and their ratings influenced the early success of a film, but even he found that they did have an effect. And this may be one of 
of the reasons why more recently some studios have begun to withhold movies from critics prior to the film's opening. For them, the risk of receiving an overwhelming number of negative reviews before the film opens is too great. Some critics have developed a reputation of being overly critical, and their poor rating of a film may be fueled by a built-in bias. My whole process is also to write reviews uh, about what the film intended to be, not comparing everything to Citizen Kane. You know, I don't judge a movie against greatness. I judge a movie uh, against what its as aspirations were in the first place, and maybe what audience it's targeting too. I may not be the audience for some of these movies that I review, I realize that, but I know the audience is out there. Research has shown that negative reviews have the potential to hurt revenue more than positive reviews can help revenue. According to Egan's study, negative reviews had more of an impact than positive reviews on both wide releases and limited releases. And previous research has found evidence of a negativity bias from critics' reviews. For wide releases, we found that the revenue difference between movies with negative and positive reviews was an average of $23 million for opening weekend and $83 million for total revenue. This negativity bias may be the result of something known as loss aversion, a concept that was introduced under the prospect theory in 1979 by psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. The theory states people make decisions based on the potential value of losses and gains rather than the final outcome. The idea here is that the pain of losing is psychologically about twice as powerful as the pleasure of gaining, meaning if you know there's a potential for loss, chances are you won't take the gamble, because according to their theory, losses loom larger than gains. And according to Ben Carlson, co-founder of social media research from Physiology, bad Rotten Tomato scores cause greater changes in audience opinion than good Rotten Tomato scores. Bad reviews have become an uphill battle, and review trolls are becoming a standard risk for movie studios. A lot of trolls, as they do on the internet in general, start, start to take over. They discover a power play here, and it's generally with superhero movies, or things like that, that have a real big fanboy base. And so they will go in and if they don't like something they see in a trailer or they don't like the way they're being treated by the studio or they don't like this or they don't like some actor that was hired, they are going to go and troll this thing and they are going to try to destroy this movie before it gets to first base. That is unfair and, a, and, a, and a, a, an enterprise should not exist that is able to do that to a movie. It's really unfair. Review bombing, which is essentially a coordinated effort to throw a bunch of negative ratings at a film all at once, is something that not only studios have to watch out for, but also sites like Rotten Tomatoes. The most recent attack was on Captain Marvel, which received a wave of negative early ratings from people complaining about the social justice warrior politics of Brie Larson. In response, Rotten Tomatoes stopped allowing users to submit online reviews before a movie opens. Remember when we talked about verified ratings earlier in the video? This is one of the reasons why the company decided to add this new feature to their audience score. And movie studios have actually employed a similar tactic. In an effort to deter negative reviews, some studios have begun delaying when critics' reviews get posted. Let's take the Emoji Movie, for example, which was one of the 150 films released in 2017 that we mentioned earlier. The Emoji Movie was able to do something no other movie could during that tough summer season at the box office. They were able to survive a brutal Rotten Tomato score of 7%. And many believe that the main reason why they were able to do this is because Sony wouldn't let reviews post until midday on July 27th, hours before the film's release. Across the board, researchers have contradictory findings on the influence of sites like Rotten Tomatoes. There's also disagreement on the influence of critics in general as it relates to box office outcomes. Additionally, despite Egan's findings on the influence of critics on limited releases, some believe that a site like Rotten Tomatoes can have an overwhelmingly positive impact on documentaries or indie films. Here's a quote by Donna Giliotti, who produced films Hidden Figures and Silver Linings Playbook. For a picture that doesn't have a brand name and doesn't have movie stars, Rotten Tomatoes tomato scores can enhance the box office. Another interesting takeaway, and surprisingly something that both critics and researchers seem to agree on, is the power of word of mouth. Word of mouth is certainly the most influential factor on a movie's success. Um, all of the research and anecdotal evidence uh, points to that. I believe in word of mouth. I believe the best thing that you can do is not reviews or anything else, it's tell each other things. All a critic can do is point you to a movie. Ultimately, it's going to be you deciding that and you telling your friends. All that said, we've reached the part of the video where we pass the question off to you. Do you think word of mouth is still the best way to encourage people to go and see a new release? Or do you think that sites like Rotten Tomatoes have more of an influence on box office outcomes? Do you find yourself visiting the site before going to see a movie? Do you take the time to read reviews or do you just look at the score? Comment below and let us know. If you like this video and want more, be sure to give us a thumbs up and click that subscribe button. To stay up to date on 
social, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Rogue Rocket. My name's Maria Sosian. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you back here again soon.